This is the last session, but it's also the Jerry Lee lecture. Uh, and I think I should start, because this is unusual in that Jerry's not actually here, uh, in paying tribute to Jerry's consistent support uh, for both for Campbell and also for research in particularly in the area of policing and crime and justice. Um, I'm also very grateful for, uh, for, the, for Queen's University's in, enormously generous hosting of this event as well. It's been, it's been a pleasure. Um, so what I thought I would uh, talk about in this is, is the kind of how, does the, how do we get this uh, research that we're, we're all so keen to have out into the field, in my case the particular field being uh, the police. And it is ironic. Uh, so David Weisberg was here earlier and won an award and is somewhere in the air on his way to, uh, to Mexico uh, as we speak um, before uh, going to George Mason where we'll meet again on Sunday and then on to the UK where we meet again in about 10 days time. That, uh, is <laughs> that's the way that David and I spend our time together. Um, however, we first ever met at a Campbell colloquium. Um, and I stood up on the podium and I talked about policing research and I happened to mention that everyone in the audience or anyone in policing should read David's research, which I think he may have been slumbering at the time, but he certainly woke up. <laughs> As most academics do when someone in the field actually points out they read your paper. And there was a context to it as well because, uh, I mean, this is, you know, more than, uh, more, than it's more than a dozen years ago, I think. Uh, there's a context in that it, this was the era where uh, a great deal of the focus of, of the academic literature in policing was on what doesn't work rather than what does. It was still that era, certainly in policing. And these are two very distinguished sets of commentators. One, David Bailey describing that the, that the police is ability to prevent crime as a myth, and Gottfriedson and Hershey, uh, which could be described as the sort of textbook that just about every undergraduate has to read, also, dis also pointing out that it's really not much point in tipping money into the police because they don't do much. Well, certainly not much to deal with crime, which I have to say as a chief constable is one of the many reasons that, you, you, that it's quite difficult to encourage police officers to read academic texts because they don't, on the whole, tend, or they didn't tend, to contain a lot of good news up to that point. But actually, that verdict was already out of date, because there had been a series, uh, or the beginnings of a series, of randomised control trials on hotspots, on the ability of the police, if put in the right place, uh, to impact very significantly on crime in high crime places. Uh, the art of it, however, was to, was, to, was to get the police to understand what a high crime place actually was, that it wasn't a whole neighbourhood, and furthermore, that in response to the very obvious intuitive sense that if I put my police on that street corner, the crime will just go round the corner, uh, the science actually then followed it up by pointing out that wasn't the case. Uh, the blue line in this, in this is, the tre is the treatment area, and the two lines at the bottom are the envelopes either side of the treatment area, which show a similar, and, and, and they're not quite as sub substantial, but a similar drop in crime to the treatment area. Crime doesn't go round the corner, because it's the spot, the high crime spot, that contains most of the ingredients as to why the crime takes place. It is bespoke to that place, not general to the whole of, a whole of your community. And indeed, I don't think we could be sitting in a city that more accurately illustrates that than Belfast. The place, place in Belfast is so absolutely crucial, but it is the precise place, not the whole neighbourhood, that matters. As you can see if you go around the city and look, for example, at the walls and the murals, they are very precisely placed, just as crime is very precisely placed. And lo and behold, shortly after David and I first met, the National Academy of Sciences pointed out that actually there was some evidence that the police uh, were effective. I have to say, this, is, this book sits on my shelves. It's a moment of optimism. And as David pointed out in the introduction, I was, found myself trying to create an agency in the United Kingdom with a mission to improve policing, which was one of those 
wonderfully optimistic moments that, uh, that the last Labour government had uh, about a vision for trying to improve public services. And I was given that, that task and to create a, a strategy for improving policing in which science, uh, there's no need to read all the words in this, uh, it, was a mo it was a moment of glorious bureaucratic optimism, but just focus on the word science. We were talking about the way in which science could help uh, in developing policing. And as part of that, uh, we, we sponsored, I sponsored, uh, I think it was in the end, I think it was nearly, it was 10 reviews, I think, if my memory serves me right, um, with the avowed intent of finding out how much we already knew that we ought to have known in more detail uh, and how strong was that evidence uh, and getting that out to the field as fast as possible. And David and I, being world travellers, found ourselves in Harvard uh, with a session with American police officers uh, who were perhaps equally sceptical about the science. So we wrote a paper together called Police Science Towards a New Paradigm in which we proposed that the police could be transformed by taking ownership of science. Uh, but it's an interesting feature of this field that we hadn't even published it before there was a counterblast from other members of the session suggesting that we were completely mad. Well, obviously, slightly more educated language, uh, but it suggested, broadly speaking, that we'd lost the plot. So, as with all good things in the academic world, we thought we should go somewhere really nice and think about it. Uh, I'm very grateful to the Rockefeller Foundation for allowing us both time to think uh, in the awfully dingy surroundings of Bellagio. Uh, lovely bedroom, canaletto on the wall, view of the mountains, great food, and obviously time to think. So we thought, so how, would, how could this work? And this really matters, I, I, I tell this as a tale of humour, but actually this really matters in this audience. It's fine doing systematic reviews, but if they don't impact the field and they don't make a real difference, then they are but another artefact in a library, and that is not where we collectively want to be. So we had to think, why, why would this be a particularly good moment? Because actually there's a lot about timing in these things. Why would this be a particularly good... I'm sorry, I haven't got any pictures of penguins. I'm very sorry about that. <laughs> Now that was a spectacular presentation. I've been looking for penguins overnight, but I can't quite find any. But I have got a few rather disorientated police officers, and perhaps they'll do. Okay, so how, how is this a good moment? Well, actually, as it turns out, this is a particularly good moment. Because if you take, as we have done in both the U most of the USA and, uh, quite, and most, of the, most of Europe, if you take 20 to 25% out of the budget of the police service, you force thinking about what actually works. You force people to reflect, and they have a choice. They either retreat back to something they don't want to retreat back to, which is simply doing rapid response to calls, uh, a random patrol, and reactive investigation, which the three R's model of policing, which was the professional model of the 1950s. They either retreat back to that, which, by the way, doesn't work, or they think about what is the evidence for something really different and how could we transform. And more than that, since that 1950s uh, uh, philosophy that was developed primarily actually by a man called O.W. Wilson uh, in the, in, as, as a, a, a cop who was in the, world of, in the academic world, uh, since that time we've become to understand much better. In fact, if you had a large sum of money to invest in reducing crime, You'd invest it in the middle of this diagram, in the safety and security web, not necessarily on the left-hand side with the police or policing, because actually you're going to get more bang for your bucks in reducing crime by looking at all the players in the middle of that diagram, not the ones on the, on the left. Not the least of which, because if you think you're going to develop an effective strategy to prevent crime by relying on the criminal justice system, think again. Uh, and it's not just simply that the police are shockingly bad at arresting and detecting crime, it's just actually the police never hear about most of it. Uh, and that is probably a good thing because most of it probably doesn't merit criminal justice action. Uh, and we know that for, most, you know, for every arrest, around, an offender commits about another, about another 30 offences. 
Um, so the idea that you know, re-offending figures bear any sort of relationship to reality, think on. So prevention is a much more complicated process. Sorry, this is not the sort of stuff I used to stand up and say when I was a police chief. Okay, let's just be clear about that. <laughs> my tone was somewhat different. You could rely on my statistics in those days. Uh, these days... <laughs> These days, obviously, I'm in a slightly different position, so I can reflect with more objective thought. But actually, the reality is that this is, we, you know, every, every police chief knows the difference between the numbers arrested and the numbers charged and the numbers convicted. So don't rely on the criminal justice system. And if you look at the debate that's been going on around the world about uh, you know, why has crime dropped in most countries, in fact, almost all countries, why has crime dropped, it is a combination of these factors. This, is a, this was a very nice presentation that Jan van Dijk, who was responsible for the International Crime Victim Survey, gave. And the combination of opportunity, uh, the, you know, the level of the, to feeding into a level of crime, feeding into a sense that there is a lot of crime going on, and feeding into countermeasures, and then that, that cycle being broken by the countermeasures, that kind of makes sense. It particularly makes sense, this diagram actually illustrates the, the staged introduction of engine immobilizers in Australia, and there's a pretty strong, in fact, there's a very strong correlation between the introduction of engine immobilizers in Western Australia and a crime drop and the introduction in the rest of Australia. And you can do this for device after device. There's a particularly beautiful illustration when the Germans passed a law requiring uh, motorcyclists to wear a helmet, which basically meant it wasn't quite so easy to get on a motorcycle and ride off, and motorcycle thefts dropped by over 70%. And this, this is a nice illustration of changing the laws on, uh, on, on, on the fitting of locks in the Netherlands, and you can follow. There's the same diagram for the UK, and you can follow your way around. And indeed, you can also look at the countries that weren't so clear. So, for example, Switzerland saw nothing like the, the, the drop in... Uh, in Burgery because it didn't, it decided, I mean, I'm Swiss, so I can say this, the Swiss process of trying getting a single law across the whole country is not straightforward. As a result, there wasn't the level of consistency that, uh, that, that, that ensued in other countries. So, if you're the cops and you're looking around and thinking, well, most of, most of this, and I do this, every police audience I talk to, we start, I start off by depressing them. By pointing out, I would get them to put their hands up. So how much of a part did you play in the drop from seven, 700,000 motor vehicle thefts to 54,000 in the United Kingdom over 25 years? I asked them to put their hands up. And well, they've, they got quite used to it. Now nobody puts their hand up because they weren't responsible for that. There was, that was the, the safety and security web. That's what worked in that respect. But they are responsible for significant elements, for example, of reducing burglary. There are elements which are significantly down to the cops. So... Owning the science really matters. And evidence-based policing, the ability, as Larry Sherman has put it, to use research to guide practice really does have potential for the police in a way that it didn't have 25, 30 years ago. And particularly when you start thinking about the fact that the police have a fairly straightforward set of tools that they use, and they primarily rely on ingredients like deterrence, so preventive patrol, arrest, prosecution, and then releasing and post-release supervision. The last one, incidentally, is by far the largest growing area uh, of policing, partly because, for example, in the United States, so many more people are coming out of prison, uh, and partly because of the realisation uh, across the world that you know, putting someone inside means they're actually going to come out and you need to supervise them effectively in the community as well. And one of the things that has been absent over time has been has been thinking, the police thinking their way through the active ingredient in the treatment. So, you know, back to, the, back to a medical model, if, if arrest was a, tube, was a tube of skin cream, what's the active ingredient? Uh, and it's not mostly water. There are significant elements in it. And how would you know that? What would work best? What's the dosage? If you're doing hotspot patrol, how many police officers do you need to be effective in getting the crime down? Uh, and just as an illustration of that, very big randomized two, two re randomized control trials in Philadelphia. In the first one, they had four young police officers. One of the great things about young police officers newly out of training school is they do what they're told. So when they were told to patrol the hotspot, they patrolled the hotspot. In the second trial, they had two experienced officers. What do we know about experienced police officers? They're too experienced to do what they're told. 
So when they were asked to patrol the hotspot, they went, and went into the coffee shop and moaned about the fact they were being asked to do something that didn't seem to make sense to them. The result of that was the crime didn't drop. So dosage and treatment really matter. And then, actually, it's really important to understand what we already know. So one of the things that David and I sat and thought about when we were obviously sitting on the front on the lake looking out towards Lake Como, because it, it does improve your concentration. Um, is, so what systematic reviews taught us? And actually, a huge amount. Over the last 10 years, we have done a huge amount of work in the Campbell Group to get this, this, this material in and to really understand what it does actually tell us and how consistent that message is. We have a very different portrait, as it says here from the 1990s, about what we know and what it tells us. We have a long list of studies that have been done, which is getting longer, um, particularly when one or two of them are finished, Charlotte. Sorry to pick you out, but it just, you know, you're in my eye line, <laughs> and we had that discussion last week. But we know, <laughs> we know that there are things that work and there are things that don't work. So we know that hotspot policing, uh, and incidentally, just as a matter of interest, if this was a group of police officers, uh, and it doesn't matter how senior they are, it doesn't matter where they are in the world, one of the other questions I always ask in this room is, who has read any of the studies on hotspot policing? Guess how many hands go up? About as many as going up now. Not one single one. They will not have read the studies, so they will not understand that a hotspot means something like this. It's just there. It's not the whole of this room. It's just there. They don't understand it. They haven't read it. The science is not, is not there, but we do know it. Focused deterrence, problem-oriented policing. There's a whole set of strategies and tactics that we have that, for which we have strong support. And there's a whole set on the other, other side where we know perfectly well that they don't. Police service puts a huge amount of effort into trying to reduce the stress of officers who've been involved in difficult situations, and it's a completely wasted investment. There is absolutely no evidence that any of them work. And the principal reason for that is the low level of trust between frontline officers and their senior managers about the motivation for asking them to go on stress relief courses. Uh, broadly speaking, most frontline officers think this is a glorious scheme uh, concocted by management in order to get rid of them, which is not a great message about leadership in the police service. And the lessons that come out of the science are very clear. Focus, and you will increase effectiveness. Be proactive in your problem solving. You will increase, increase effectiveness and go beyond the traditional approaches, so think innovatively. But if you're going to think innovatively, then you need to start getting into the next thing, which is you need to be able to translate the, the, the evidence of those, of those pieces into frontline uh, officers' daily usage. They need to have the access to the tools. George Mason's um, uh, matrix is a, is a very good attempt to try and do this, which now is now being further developed into trying to produce, produce translation tools that work in terms of training and education and practice. And as I'll go on to say, that, that's, a, that's the critical barrier. Police officers like lawyers, are trained in the law, not how the law works and what it produces as an outcome. The most police training, no, I'll rephrase that, all police training that I have seen in all the countries, and that's, a, that's about 70 or 80 around the world, that I've either been to and watched training or provided advice to, is about throwing a huge book of law and procedure at people, not any knowledge about how that works. Uh, and the only other variation is that depending on where you are, there is slightly more or slightly less training on how, to, on how to inflict pain, anguish, and if necessary, death on people. And I'm not exaggerating. There's practice on use of force on the one hand and law and law on the other, but not in the middle of the science education that's required. And this is a little piece of, uh, piece of work that Cody Tellup did on so how prepared are police officers to make use of the science evidence, uh, which neatly illustrates that because, you, because police officers don't routinely read the material and don't routinely access it, on the whole, uh, a very high percentage of the way that the police make their judgment is based on experience, not evidence. And if we're thinking about, so what would evidence-based practice actually look like, well, police officers are pretty good at the three things on the right hand, or the right and bottom of this diagram. Yes, 
we use our management, uh, managerial and professional expertise, yes, we're pretty good at understanding the organisational characteristics. Uh, and actually, most police forces are pretty good at understanding their stakeholders' concerns and values. But the best available scientific evidence is, is often a component that's not played into the mix. Nor indeed is there a clear understanding of actually if you were presented with a piece of research, what, what does it mean? Global warming? The evidence is clear. <laughs> Can't do penguins, but I can do underwear, okay? <laughs> Sorry. And particularly, which design works for what? So this is one I particularly use in training, is trying to, trying to explain to people the differences between what you can get out of a quantitative study and what you can get out of a qualitative study and how and why you need to know the right questions to ask. Preferably, indeed, as has been, a, has been a major theme across this conference from what I've seen, is understanding that the two are a critical part of answering the, the whole question. You need probably, in most cases, need both. And there is an important shift going on at the moment to try and understand uh, and it's in, you know, in several centres, several of them represented here, to try and understand how knowledge is most effectively produced in policing and spread to the, to the front line. So George Mason focused on how the researchers work with the police. Uh, Laura Bedford at Queen, at, in Queensland working out how the police have learnt from experiments. Anthony Braga find, finding out who's done the experiments and how that relationship has worked. Uh, and I've been working on how to conduct experiments in policing and how that can be most effectively done. There is not a long tail to the experiments that have been done in policing. Uh, it was a pretty hesitant start in the 1960s. Oddly, the very first one that I can find was done in 1963 in Liverpool. Uh, but there, was a, there, there were then a set of studies. There was domestic, a phase of them. There were domestic violence. There were hotspot studies and patrol studies. Uh, and really the key to this whole process was a group of scholars and a group of, of innovative police chiefs prepared to play. It is a big thing for a police chief to do a randomised control trial to which you don't know the answer. A big thing. Because, because to do a major uh, innovation that then doesn't work is a big risk in policing. So this is hard, this is hard territory to go down. But we have seen a very significant increase in the number of studies being done over the last few years. Mo the, by far the majority in the area of hotspots, restorative justice and domestic violence. And there has been a slightly up and down-ish sort of growth, but if I was to add the current UK set, it is very considerable. Uh, and a very considerable part of that, uh, I think, comes down to the, to the, to the police academic partnership piece that is the really tricky piece, which I, which I know has, has, will, will have been a matter of discussion this week. Uh, this is an extraordinary number of experiments when you consider how many have been done in the last 30, 40 years. And in fact, it's by no means the full list. There's around about 22 being done at the moment in the UK on a whole range of different subjects. And it's not just that they're being done in the UK. This is a room full of assistant and deputy commissioners uh, in Australia sitting doing a masterclass on evidence-based policing in which they are designing experiments to be done in Australia. So we've, we've managed to infect Australia as well. I hasten to add that consistent with my Bellagio approach, I do believe in a good beach and that is the view back to where we were holding that meeting. So I'd just like to point out that <laughs> being an academic should be fun. Uh, and actually a huge part of that was being able to explain to the group present about live trials that are in progress and the challenge of doing them and giving, being able to convince them that not only could they be done but you didn't have to wait for the results to get lessons out of the process. Uh, one of the great critiques of this process is that we and I now use my, now we put my academic hat on, we go away and do a study, we, we write it up, we get it peer reviewed, it gets published in a peer reviewed journal and that is around about a two to three year process. In the life of a police chief that is, that is appointment, 
attempting to make success, and at year three, if you're lucky, you're still in post. If you're not, you've left. Okay, so three-year cycle is not great. This is the trial that I've been conducting in Birmingham. Uh, it's, it's designed to test whether somebody that's going, that, that's, uh, that might otherwise have been prosecuted could just as easily be dealt with by a turning point treatment, which is a, 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 basically it's a, a deferred prosecution with a set of conditions applied. We're taking low harm uh, uh, offenders that the police have decided to prosecute. Uh, we've, we've, we've take, we take them through a process in which they have a meeting with a, uh, a police offender manager. Uh, we randomly assign them we randomly assign them as between prosecution and treatment, which is a unique trial in those terms. Nobody else has managed to pull this one off. Uh, and we're assessing the reoffending, re victim satisfaction, cost benefit. And we've done some other things that are important in this field is we've put an awful lot of trust in frontline police officers, not only to design the trial, but also to be engaged in running it, as in they are responsible for the randomization decisions, not the academics, which is the kind of traditional model, certainly in policing, very traditional model. And they were very much responsible for designing how the treatment would be, would be put in place. So for this, this is about offenders who come, that's voluntary, they, otherwise they can, you know, they can elect to be prosecuted if they want to, but they have the opportunity to go into the turning point process. If they comply with it, they don't get a conviction. If they don't, they get prosecuted. And this is quite useful because I literally, within 10 minutes before we came in here, got sent the spreadsheet confirming the 400 cases. So we have actually completed the trial. Uh, it's been a, quite a long journey. This has taken us two and a half years. Now, under normal circumstances, that would be a problematic journey for the, for, the, for the police. But the reality is, because we did it in phases, we've already been able to give them... Uh, Two, you know, two years worth of lessons in how to make more consistent decisions, how to treat victims better, how to, uh, to, to, put, to, to manage offenders more effectively in the community, simply on the basis of taking the work out of systematic reviews on each and every element of it and feeding those back into practice to improve, so giving them, giving them back the evidence that was already out there and training uh, some 400 officers in how to do randomised trials and in the evidence for better practice. So, how could, we, how could we make this work more consistently? There's not a lot been written in policing, a couple of good pieces, but not a lot been written on how to get this, this process to work more effectively. Larry Sherman has written about building field test stations. Well, Birmingham in the UK certainly is one of those. We've got about eight or nine trials running in one, or, or being completed in Birmingham. And building the social relationships between uh, between the researchers and the executive and getting sound hypotheses and recruiting. And Heather Strang, who's also done a considerable number of, of trials, uh, has also focused on getting good intellectual foundations, getting good social foundations between the researchers and the police, and getting all the, getting all the, the, the contractual bits right, uh, particularly with data, because as researchers we know very well that data is crucial as a police officer, I know, I know very well that data is complicated to share. But these are difficult things to do. Getting cases is a nightmare. Re-randomization, you cannot, well, yes, you probably can, believe the ingenuity of police officers to re-randomize cases. It's quite extraordinary. Uh, we, we, had, we had to rebuild the randomizer in several stages to avoid the enormous ingenuity to re-roll the dice and get the answer that you wanted. Uh, however, we, we have eventually succeeded. And we've also had to explore you know, what leadership in experiments means, that it requires you to build a sustained coalition between the researcher uh, and, the, and the, police, the police involved, which is not the normal practice uh, in, in, the, in, the, in these type of relationships. Manage the tensions effectively and develop good processes to do it. This, is, this has been a particularly complicated process and it, it may help that the Chief Constable used to be my deputy or it may not. Uh, it certainly, made it, certainly made, it made it easier in some senses but it also made it much more difficult in others. And what we've been trying to build as we've gone along is 
uh, is a framework that we can then use to put into other places of, and train others, which we've used already in the masterclasses in Australia, we're using, starting to use in masterclasses in the UK. How do you get experiments to work? And we, we start, I started off by looking at all the experiments that have ever been done and trying to find the, fra the, the framework, which, of this, which is the starting point. And then we went round, uh, I got a, a colleague, a colleague from the University of Queensland to interview the folk in the field. I can't interview police officers, they still call me sir, and that is not the basis for, a step, for, a, for an effective qualitative interview, as far as I could see from the literature. Uh, and we, interv we interviewed 20 key players in the process, coded them up, and found the things that really, really matter to make, this, to make a really complicated experiment sustain over a lengthy period of time. Firstly, getting things that are consistent, that where the researcher understands what the force and the police are trying to do, so it's consistent with priorities, and building a good relationship, fairly obviously, and good leadership. All of those you could, I could have written you know, without doing the research, but the surprising ones for me was just how important it was, not just for the sustaining of the, of the trial, but also for the, for the feeling amongst officers that they had personally gained from the experience that they, they had developed their own police science education as they went along. There was one particular interview, a rather dusty custody officer who started off having been asked, why were you involved in this trial? The answer, because I was told to. Didn't seem to me to, 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 to show much promise for the, follow the rest of the interview until we got about three or four lines down. Uh, and this particular sergeant said, but I have learnt an enormous amount. I now do things completely differently because I understand things that I didn't understand before. And that was a consistent message coming through. The importance of field training and changing the education base uh, of, the, of the police service. And the importance of a practitioner peer group who felt empowered, having listened to that training, to make adjustments to the trial and to build practice as they went along. The importance of the, of the development that the UK is going through of creating a professional body for policing uh, whose overall ethos is to drive a very different approach to the educational basis for police officers. Uh, that it is not just about a huge law exam, it is not just about learning how to use force more effectively and prevent, prevent, prevent causing injuries, it is fundamentally about understanding the evidence for your practice and turning that into reality. It is about having tools uh, that are available, this, one, this one's been around for a long time and has been well used, but, but actually tools that are available that make it easy for you to take a particular initiative, see what's out there that, uh, that gives you a reasonable chance that the hypothesis will work and then test it properly. And when I say test it properly, I don't just mean a pre and post test in which a senior police officer stands up and announces proudly that crime went down. That is not a test. That is, that is a mythical statement of hope. But it's also a big burden on science and this group of people, these, these, this type of research, uh, to, to come forward and to make sure that what's being done is being done in a way that significantly links with the field and the field's concerns and anxieties. It'd be fair to say that one of the reasons why most of the police journals don't get read by most police officers is because there is very little in them that is of any interest whatsoever to the average police officer. There are a lot of, I'm sure, academically fine articles, but they are absolutely not touching on things that matter. Whereas we've been very, very clear in the Campbell Crime and Justice Group, we do things, uh, which I think is what my, you know, one, of, one of my particular roles in the group, we do things that really matter to the field, and we've, we've stuck to the knitting because the knitting really matters in getting the message across. And there's currently a piece of work, a What Works Centre piece of work that the National College of Policing is doing in the UK, which is about gathering in all of the What Works material and producing it back out in a form uh, where, where it is assessed. It's, it's, it, you know, it's going, going con quite considerably further, I think, than the George Mason uh, piece of work, largely because, in this case, it's been given a significant amount of money to do it. Um, and alongside that, a piece of work to gather all of the material that we might need in future reviews in such a way into, a, into a, a database which will make it quicker and faster for us to be able to do reviews, which I think is also absolutely critical in policing, so that we can speed up the process of developing and organising the knowledge. Which sort of takes us back 
uh, to some of the points that were made in the excellent presentation on poverty that was uh, just before lunch. And that is that it is still the case that, uh, for example, the, you know, both two parties have just decided to support uh, double sentences for knife crime, despite the fact that all the evidence is that that type of sentencing is not hugely effective. Um, and that there is still a very strong bias uh, in, in, our, in politics, not just in the UK, uh, in fact, almost universally in politics, uh, to look for things that agree with what you want to agree with, rather than to really seriously examine the evidence. Uh, the evidence, the real evidence on crime prevention may be unexciting, but it is the evidence and it would be far better to do it uh, and to do it more effectively than, uh, than do some of the things. But it, this is a difficult conversation. It's a difficult conversation with the regulators uh, who are particularly ill-tuned uh, to, listen to listen to those lessons. And this is probably the most difficult piece of the, of the, of the equation, is changing the behaviours and changing the, the intuitive understanding of what policing is. David Wilson and I were discussing this before, before, before I spoke. Policing is so different to most people's intuition. It is not uh, a, a process of 99 or 911 response anymore. It is not the, 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 the process of general patrol and, and the kind of warm and cuddly feeling. It's a, the, if it's done well, it's a completely different operation. And that completely different operation means that police officers now have to, have to know the science and be able to explain it and explain exactly how it works in a way that, that connects with the public and which listens to their concerns so that ultimately policing in order to deliver science understands the balance between that best available evidence, their own expertise and professional practice, their organisation and the way it's set up and above all the public and the politicians uh, values and expectations and that is a really difficult thing to do in policing as it is in every other public service that we're concerned about uh, at this session. Thank you.